Um, all right, everybody. Uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Uh, this is our, our last session, but always one of the most interesting ones we have. Certainly, we get to hear from the guys that are on the on the ground uh, in the fields and uh, finding out what's working for them, what's not working for them, and um, kind of a little bit about uh, different things that are being applied in different parts of uh, North America, which is uh, a really be big benefit uh, for everyone that's coming in. Uh, we've got four great farmers um, from different parts of North America. And um, so we're gonna let them just kind of introduce themselves, tell us, tell us a little bit about what they're doing as far as farming um, and what uh, their operations are about. And then from there on, we'll go into some questions. I'll have a few questions for them, and then we'll open it up for, uh, for our audience to ask questions. And hopefully they can give you some ideas on what you can be doing in, the, uh, in your uh, farming operations. If you haven't started yet, or if you started and you've got a few other things you have in mind, you can learn from the best. So we'll start off with uh, Clinton. Clinton uh, Munchuk, please go ahead and uh, you can start your presentation. Excellent, thank you very much, Andrew. I'm just gonna go to the share, there you go. So we all should be able to see this. Um, hi everybody, my name is Clinton Monchuk. Uh, I'm one of the owners with uh, Monchuk Farms and um, just gonna give you a little bit of a background in terms of what our farm is, um, how we're using some of the precision ag products uh, right now. But one of the things I do wanna just touch off the top with is uh, we're not a huge farm. Um, we don't buy new technology or new equipment every year. Um, I think we're kind of middle of the road kind of farmers and hopefully for majority of you who are listening today, this kind of resonates with you. I do want to go through a little bit of a background of our farm. Uh, my grandfather took over the, or came over after World War I, um, uh, looking for a better life, ended up um, settling just outside of a small town called Lanigan, Saskatchewan. Predominantly, we were a mixed farm through the generations, uh, grain, beef, and um, dairy. Uh, and we sold our, our cattle and the dairy farm in 2009, now focusing primarily on grain. Um, just in terms of our structure, I own the farm with my brother. It's kind of a weird setup, but it's a partnership with two incorporated companies. One's owned by um, my brother and his wife, and one's owned by me. Um, but it effectively is the same farming business uh, that we've had in the past, just under a little bit of a different structure. And I do want to say that um, for those of you who are farming with family members, I, I think it's uh, very key that you uh, not only have to farm with them, but you have to have Thanksgiving meals with them as well. And, and this guy, I definitely could probably not farm with anybody else. He's a great business partner and great farmer. I do want to touch on a couple other elements of our farms. We have an egg farm as well. Uh, Monchuk Egg Farms or Meg Farms. Um, we bought into the, the quota system in a new entrant program. These are my kids. Uh, CRA says if I have a picture of them, I can use them as tax write-offs, so I do. Uh, we produce about 3 million eggs every year. And then I also married into a ranching family down in Oklahoma, um, purebred Black Angus, so we have some experience on the cattle side and some of the technologies we use with that. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I, I'm also the executive director of Farm and Food Care Saskatchewan. A lot of what I do, a lot of the tours that I do um, are trying to make sure consumers understand more of what we're doing. A lot of this precision egg stuff, uh, consumers find super interesting and something that uh, I'm excited to talk to them about. So our farm, particular on the grain farm, we have 4,400 acres, uh, but there's a chunk of that that we just can't farm. It's, it's pasture land, it's bush, it's, it's water areas. Um, so of that 4,400 acres, um, we plant about 3,650. Now that depends. I know um, uh, the other farmers on here probably tile their land. We don't have any tiling in our area. So when we have a wet spring, we just can't physically plant those acres. They're just underwater. Um, <clears throat> so a lot depends on how well that uh, spring runoff happens and, and how we can get into the field. Uh, we're very diverse in terms of our, our cropping rotation, mainly canola, malting barley, um, wheat and yellow peas, but we also throw in a, a smack of oats, mustard, rye, soybeans, kind of to mix things up depending on market prices and, and new technologies that are coming out. 
One of the things that if I could just say one thing, our focus is really around sustainability. The hope as we go through our, our, um, our business is that a fourth generation will take over the farm into the future. And what I mean by that is, is when we're looking at, and I, I stole this pick this morning, but we're looking at trying to make sure the environment uh, is looked after, we can make money, and we're actually adapting to the changes of consumer demands. So if I can kind of push that down into one thing that we need to focus on every year, it's our soil. And from our soil, everything else happens. So our aim is to always improve the soil. And uh, my background is economics. So I always feel that you can't manage what you don't measure. So uh, we've done a lot of work with, with um, soil profiling over the years. And, and this past year was a great example. And this is a, an example from Western Egg. This is the company we, we work with. Um, but I know there's numerous other companies out there in North America that do the same thing. Um, we typically were putting on, say, between 80 and 110 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, this last year was a great example of how we could actually save a little money on our uh, fertilizer costs. And it had everything we were maximizing. Our, our yields in the area were average to above average um, when compared to other neighbors. They were at par or better than, than neighbors. So we're not losing anything in our production. But this little bit of, of better soil profiling every year on each piece of land, we find gives us a better edge in terms of being, being able to adapt um, to where we need to go. Now, uh, in terms of getting, making sure we, uh, the, the new term, uh, I believe from Fertilizer Canada is, is the 4R nutrient system. So the right fertilizer, the right amount, the right place, um, and one other right, there's four R's, I can't remember the last one. Um, but we ended up getting a um, mid-row banding system for our, our planter um, where we can directly uh, shoot that nitrogen NH3 down into those uh, very tight furrows. The level of, of loss of nitrogen is, is extremely low. We also have the precision uh, openers for seed uh, and seed place fertilizer. And we're just finding that the results from, from using this, this machine have been great. Um, we direct seed, we don't till our land at all, and that organic matter continues to grow on our, our land and, and we're seeing better results. In terms of some of our, our uh, the technologies from within that, um, rate control and sectional control, uh, we use a, a Trimble 2050, um, one of the newer models from Trimble, but uh, it allows us to have a, our variable rate in there as well as our sectional control. Uh, working through the numbers on this, it saves us roughly about 9.5% on our fertilizer costs every year. It's more environmentally friendly and uh, it, it's pretty easy to use. I like showing this picture because um, obviously, and, and I'm not too sure with the other guys, but not all our fields, even though it's Saskatchewan, are straight as an arrow. We do have bush. We do have uh, different tree lines we're going in. This is a, a tree line that I'm going uh, through. Um, so we have to cut off those sections and it really makes a, a, a world of difference when you're not putting that extra fertilizer on that land. Um, moving over into our spraying technology, we moved this last year. We had an Apache uh, with the Raven um, uh, GPS and, and sectional control system. And we upgraded and moved into a case with uh, AIM control uh, and a Pro 700 monitor, as well as bigger booms and a bigger tank. The savings on this weren't as big as is on our um, our fertilizer side. We feel we're anywhere between two and five percent uh, savings on our spraying costs, dependent on the field. Uh, for those of you, I think everybody's familiar with AIM technology, and I think there's other companies that have similar ones. But each individual nozzle is hooked up to your GPS and, and turn on independently as you go uh, through your field. And again, um, when we were spraying fungicide, we had quite a few areas that were just too wet to go through with the sprayer. So um, having that sectional control on a nozzle by nozzle basis was definitely beneficial. Um, in terms of our harvesting side, uh, we run case combines. Again, uh, I think other than paint, they're not a lot different than anything else, uh, but we use Pro 700 monitors uh, with GPSing and mapping within them. Um, you know, I was talking to my wife at lunchtime. She runs one of our combines. They're great in terms of having um, less fatigue for the operator. 
Um, really great to look at the maps afterwards. It's, it's great info, but really at the end of the day, I don't feel it actually generates us any more profit. Like by that time, we're looking at uh, what we have in the field and, and that's what we have. Um, all the major decisions that we've made to get that optimal crop happened, you know, four months ago when, or even earlier than that when we were starting to make our decisions. So uh, great. Um, I love talking on the phone and, and combining at the same time. I think it's great. Um, but I think um, just in terms of profitability, it's, it's really more for the convenience of the operator. Um, so if I could kind of sum things up and then pass it on uh, back to Andrew, we like to keep you know, current information, current technology, but it has to fit with sustainability on our farm. And really at the end of the day, for us to pay for it, it, it needs to make sense. So we're not, like I mentioned, buying brand new X9 John Deere's every year or brand new case combines or tractors. Like we just can't, we can't afford it on our farm. So what we want to do is when we purchase uh, used equipment, we usually retrofit that equipment to make sure we can put some of that new technology um, but again, it, it's got to make sense economically for us. So uh, with that, I just want to say thank you very much. And I look forward to the questions and I will stop sharing my screen. And I think Justin, you're next. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, well, thanks, Clinton. Really appreciate that. Well, Justin's getting ready to get his uh, slides up. Um, love the, the focus on sustainability. I think that's a really, that's part of uh, our theme this year with this conference. So great to hear that from you. And it looks like Justin's ready, so go ahead. All right. Uh, yeah, my name's Justin Hebert. Um, oh, I started, oh, there we go. So I am farming uh, with, it's a family farm as well. Um, my cousin on the left, my uncle, my dad, and myself, there are the four main guys, and then the there's a bunch of people that help in. My brother's around a lot and stuff too. So a little bit about me, I'm 30. I went to school to be a music teacher and decided that I didn't like hanging out with uh, teenagers that much. So on the farm, I tend to be the IT guy because I'm the least bad at computers. So when something goes wrong, they call me and then I'm supposed to figure it out, which often is just me calling the tech guy. Um, we are in Long Point, Ontario, on the north shore of Lake Erie, uh, primarily corn, soybeans, and wheat. Uh, we also grow asparagus. There's a big uh, a packer near us. And just this winter, we became precision planting dealers, which uh, has been really cool. Um, really interesting to be on the service provider side of things instead of just a, a consumer in that way, which um, we've dealt with a lot of salesmen and I definitely know what I don't like in a salesman. So it's kind of fun to be able to take that to the other side of things. Um, some history, my grandpa or my great grandfather was the first guy in the area that get a tractor. And my grandfather was quite happy about that because he didn't like smelling horse parts all day. It was his line. Um, we've done a lot of things over the years. They did sugar beets, buckwheat. Uh, one of the first farmers in the area to adopt soybeans. Um, had some cow-calf operation in the 90s. Didn't like that. Um, a lot of vegetables grown in our area. Tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers. A lot of those contracts have gone to the states now. And uh, we also got conned into growing some empress trees, which uh, was not a good gig. They can't survive the winter here, despite what the salesman tells you. Um, something we've never shied away from trying something new. Um, this was 2019, planting green into clover because we couldn't get it sprayed off. It was strip tilled in the fall of 2018 and um, not something that's typically done around here. But you can see we had a pretty good stand of corn there, um, despite the fact that it was planted in the rain. And when dad got back to the farm with that, it looked like uh, it was just salad all over the back of the planter. It was awful. Um, this year, we did all of our corn acres were strip tilled in the spring. Uh, we did some corn on corn. Uh, the middle photo there is after the planter passes went through. It's just uh, 
really nice to see that undisturbed soil. You get the benefits of working the dirt, but you know, 70% of the work stays, uh, stays no-till that way. And then that's um, side dressing. We built our own Y drops and uh, looking good. Um, this winter we built a, rebuilt a planter with a precision planting gear on it. It's super impressive technology. They're a great company. I'll try not to make this too much of a commercial, but uh, just some of the things that are really interesting. And we built this planter and it was significantly cheaper than what we priced a new case planter at. And I understand the green planters, if you're gonna get the exact emerge and everything are even more expensive. So it's a great way to save money. And I think we're technology ahead too. Delta Force is a downforce system. It adjusts multiple times a second. On the maps, you can see if you drive your pickup through the field ahead of it, it will push down extra hard through the pickup tracks. It'll show up on the map. It's really cool. And that's row by row control. Furrow Force is the new closing system. It also adapts as we go across the field. We have a lot of sand knolls and clay bottoms in the same field. So that's a big advantage for us. So we're not creating too much sidewall compaction or anything with that. V-set V-drive, uh, the picture at the bottom there on the left is all the components you'd have in a ground drive system for your planter. And on the right is V-drive. So every row is electronically controlled. You go around a corner, the inside slows down, the outside speeds up, so your population stays the same. Um, every row shuts off. Um, one of the dealers came out and saw to our hybrid test plot this year, and he couldn't believe the, the shutoff controls. You can't, they're actually, the guy running the combine was upset because you can't find the guest rows. So that was pretty cool. Speed tube, we planted all our corn between seven and eight mile an hour, and the stand was perfect. I did a bunch of population counts, and it was 99% to 100 every time. Um, the rest of that stuff I will skip, except for the smart firmer is really cool. Um, the future for us is going to have um, the smart firmer goes in the furrow on your planter and it can detect um, soil moisture, organic matter, um, CEC, clean furrow, something else. But then you can base your corn population your fertilizer rates, you can have that all change as you drive through the field. You just set up, you know, for this organic matter, I want 30,000 population. And then when we get to the low spot where it's high organic matter, I want to put the population up to 34,000. So you could prescription variable rate plant a field that you've never been in before. And uh, that is really cool. And in the future, I think they're going to be able to control your hybrids that way too. If you had a a planter set up to plant two hybrids, which um, you can really see some hybrids do well on the sand knolls and some do not. So if you paid enough attention that you could know which hybrids you wanted where, that uh, is really cool. Some of the things we are doing using precision ag on the farm, we've been doing variable rate corn population for six years at least. Um, we've been trying some variable rate beans to reduce white mold pressure. Um, we, are do, we have done some primitive VR fungicide in beans. Our planter or our sprayer needs an upgrade, but uh, he was just driving across the field and in the low spots where it was thick, he'd turn the, the first pass of the fungicide on and off. And um, ideally, we'll move to a newer sprayer and we can make the maps ahead of time. Uh, we built our own asparagus planter because the original one wasn't doing a good enough job. It was basically a plow that would open up the trench and somebody sitting on the back would just chuck the crowns in and you'd hope to get them every foot apart or so. So we built one out of an old uh, plug transplanting machine that it dug the plow and then the, the planting unit went in that trough and uh, we have way better stand in asparagus. This uh, this planting than last time around. And you only plant asparagus once every 15 to 20 years. So it's important to make that count. Um, we've done some variable rate lime scripts and then field view is also just a super accessible, easy thing. I know there's a lot of hate out there for field view. Um, 
amongst some farmers too, but uh, I, I've found it to be just the accessibility and the ease of use of it is big. There's a lot of farm stuff that's super clunky and not user-friendly, so I like that. Uh, here's some of our maps. Uh, this is a home farm. You can see across the back where the red is, that's a very sandy knoll. Um, so we're just uh, just changing as we go across the field, trying to, we're typically not saving money on seeds, but we're putting more seed where it counts. So you're making more money in the blue. And you're just trying to basically keep the weeds down in the red. Um, this is a map I made on the left, just based on the yield maps. Um, that orange on the outside is the uh, loss from the bush. And then on the far left is a sand knoll and that streak through the center is sand as well. And then on the right, you can see the field view generated their field view pro or whatever that makes the scripts. Um, so I had it pretty close. They have some more definition there. Um, this is a trial we did with Veritas on uh, soybean variable rate. Um, his map looks much more impressive than mine. And let's see, here's a map that uh, the Veritas uh, Aaron Breimer and his guys after you harvest it, they can tell you where you made money doing variable rate, where you lost money. So the potential to make is on the left and then the ideal rate is on the right. So I should have gone higher on the sand and I think higher overall too. So just interesting. One of the difficulties with the variable rate is checking to know what you did was right. So that is... Uh, something that he can help with really well. A few of the common pitfalls that I've seen with the precision egg, you have to back up all your stuff. Technology fails, you know, sometimes you just gotta reboot your phone. And if you lose all your data, that is of zero value to you. You also have to know what you're doing ahead of time. You have to make your scripts ahead. You have to know what hybrids you want where, what rates you want where. So it takes a lot more thought than just like, well, my planter is set at 32,000 for corn and that's what I plant all my fields at. So you gotta think, think through things ahead of time. You have to know how you're gonna manage your data, how you're gonna put it all in one place. So it's easy to use too. If you can't see it, you can't use it. Um, like I said before, verifying what you're doing is really hard. So Veritas has been a big help with that. Um, it can be cost prohibitive and uh, like, uh, like Clinton was saying, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes it just makes it easier and there's value in that too. And then yield monitor differences when we cut our hybrid plot, field view didn't necessarily align with our way wagon. So it's something to keep in mind that um, your yield monitor isn't perfect. And where we're going, yeah, most of that. I've talked about. So that's where we're at. Um, if you have any questions, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Justin. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Much appreciated. And uh, he's pretty good at getting back to you if you need to track him down. So, uh, <laughs> um, all right. Next, we've got Mark Brock, um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about his uh, operation, which is uh, they got all kinds of new things going on there. Well, thanks for the invitation and thanks uh, for the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about what we do here uh, at Shepherd Creek Farms uh, that uh, I'm in partnership with my wife, Sandy Brock. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to watch uh, your kids grow up too. So we have uh, a 20 year old and an 18 year old and uh, both interested in farming for different reasons. Uh, my son, uh, who's 20, is in electrical engineering and uh, really sees the opportunity for electronics and uh, applications really on the precision egg side of things, uh, whether it's in livestock or in the grain. And uh, my daughter is kind of like me. She just likes the uh, dirt and the agronomy part of uh, farming. So uh, it's pretty cool to have the opportunity to actually start farming with your, I call them kids, but they're really young adults, but we're just uh, east of Hensel, Ontario about 1700 acres, mostly corn, soybeans. We do edible beans to keep us humble and uh, some winter wheat as well. And we're strip till and no till, but uh, we will drag some iron through the soil if we have to uh, from an agronomic and economic standpoint. So uh, I don't, uh, 
I don't uh, get caught up in a singular system per se, but we do have uh, preferred methods of growing our crops. Uh, we also have sheep in the operation, uh, 450, and we have about, now well, I think Sandy raises about seven to 800 a year uh, to go to market. I am currently, and actually uh, just about, well, I guess I should say I am complete my Nuffield scholarship. Uh, for those who don't know what a Nuffield scholarship is, is a, uh, it's an opportunity provided by Nuffield Canada to do uh, uh, basically a, a research project related to Canadian agriculture. And uh, I spent two years and uh, well, it was supposed to be eight weeks before COVID, but six weeks, uh, a month in Australia and two weeks in New Zealand uh, before we came home uh, studying farmer to farmer collaborations. So uh, I just finished a 39 page report about how farmers can work better together. Uh, through collaborations and what are some of the uh, issues or problems that can arise and what are maybe some of the pathways forward to make those successful. So um, that kind of sucked up a lot of my life in the last little while. So it's kind of nice to crack out a paper that I haven't done since I was in the university uh, many moons ago. So I came home and started farming in 97 uh with my family and uh yeah about 2012 i guess was when sandy and i kind of through uh succession planning started shepherd creek farms uh and doing it on our own i'm going to spend more time probably talking today not so much of the hardware side of precision ag but more on uh where we tried to get an roi out of it um i think uh, for me we've gone down the path of precision ag for quite a while now. So, you know, as you can see, we've had a yield monitor since 99. Uh, I do have to say though, uh, with better GPS technology uh, and accuracy through RTK, um, our data from a combine really is only pretty good since about 2012, uh, just because you don't have those kind of flyer data points. Uh, it's a lot more accurate and, uh, you know, I think we're able to make some better decisions with that. So even though I have yield data all the way back to 99, I just, I don't put a lot of value in it. Uh, sometimes we'll pull it up from, for historic reference, but uh, it's kind of since this more recent information that we find it's better. Uh, and, and because of that, we kind of really went to, and with strip till trying to plan on that strip, uh, we actually run a six row strip till rig and a 12 row planner. So uh, we are RTK guidance on everything. It's in the sprayer combine, every tractor. Uh, that's just the way we do it. Uh, and to do it more cost efficiently, we've actually set up our own base station and do our own kind of cell base uh, GPS correction. Uh, and actually, I provide that service to, I think, six other farmers as well. So uh, we kind of, as I said, have our own base station. Uh, so it helps really with the cost of that. Um, we've been doing section control uh, on the planter and application technology or, or application equipment. Uh, our sprayer, uh, much like Clint's, has got the AIM command system on it. So we have the section control uh, planner is all decked out like Justin's with uh, precision planning stuff. Uh, so we kind of have all the, I call it the hardware bells and whistles on our stuff. And uh, we even have a kind of a new to us, but even though it's used a Cavernalin uh, three point hitch fertilizer spreader that actually, uh, you know, has the load cells on it and section control. Uh, within it just based on how it drops the fertilizer onto the spinners so there's some really cool hardware uh, and, and equipment technology out there in the precision egg side and uh, we've just really incorporated it as much as we can whenever we can uh, because uh, we always see that there's value in it so you know as i said our, our planner you know i think uh, i always joke that our planner has more in it in uh, aftermarket uh, precision planning parts than it, it is when i paid for the planner uh, but it's uh, just a phenomenal tool that uh, I have full confidence that when we roll into the field and plant uh, that uh, instant information we get and uh, that kind of data, you know, when I fold up and leave to go to the next one, we know we did the best job we could have uh, and the information kind of helps us uh, feel that confidence. Uh, the other thing that we kind of do too now is uh, we have our own tile plow just to try to fix some of those drainage areas that we do struggle with uh, and having the RTK guidance or the RTK data. Uh, we do have decent elevation data. So I'm pretty confident to, to kind of, you know, split some tile runs and farms and do some improvements that we can highlight from our yield maps so we can see where we are having some drainage issues and uh, we'll do that. And I think uh, drones have been played in a, a lot bigger role and will play a bigger role in our farm. Uh, 
just uh, from a, a diagnostic standpoint and uh, even from uh, a VR for a fungicide standpoint, uh, looking at uh, NDVI and, and greenness indexes and all that kind of stuff, I think we're going to use it to make more informed decisions. Uh, you know, I, I think we're really good at collecting data on our farm. I, I'm not sure we're the best at, at using it the way we should be. Uh, and that's kind of some of my focus. So when I look at data collected, uh, we are using so many freaking platforms, it's crazy because none of them are good at what, at, at everything. And it's not a criticism. I know there's a lot of probably people, company people may listen to this today and it, it's not a, a criticism to the, the platform itself. Um, but the, the needs I have are pretty wide ranging that I can't find one that really does everything that I needed to do. Uh, so we're running field view, we're running farmer's edge. Uh, we're using the agromatics from the grain cart standpoint. So uh, we're automatically uploading our, our uh, weights from our grain cart to uh, a, a platform where we can record uh, yields uh, from a per field basis, uh, per load basis. We're running the, the program Harvest Profit, uh, which recently this week actually was just acquired by uh, John Deere. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that dynamics shake out because uh, it's uh, we've been using that program for about three years now and uh, we really like it. And, and what it is, is just a, a living P&L spreadsheet. So it takes Chicago price, puts a basis that I have added into my program and it just helps me make really good informed uh, management, business, management and business decisions, especially around contracting grain and looking at profitability. So, you know, there's all these tools that we use to collect data and uh, I'm not, I guess, married to one and we use each one for its different reasons. And it, it causes some angst because uh, not they're not free. So we're, we're still trying to figure out which one's best and which one we're going to kind of spend more time with. You know, on the farm internally, we use Ag Leaders SMS advanced software to do our yield mapping. Uh, look at soil data and, and making our prescriptions and pulling in our as applied maps and also the uh, water management module to do some tile layouts as well looking at elevation so uh, that's kind of all the areas that we play in uh, in terms of just collecting data and using platform software platforms or apps or web-based tools to kind of manipulate that data so when i look at trying to turn data into dollars uh, one that's really been catching my eye more and more is, and I, I do have to give shout out to uh, Farmer's Edge. Their satellite imaging is really good. Uh, I rely on that, uh, you know, a fair bit through the growing season. And it might be hard to see on your screen here, but you can see a yield map on the left-hand side and then the satellite imaging on the right. Uh, and you can actually see how much uh, the two align. Uh, and it's helping us make some kind of yield predictions uh, sooner in the season and maybe take advantage of more market rallies because uh, it gives us a little bit of confidence on what the field might uh, yield uh, even before the combine gets there. Uh, one one uh, a tool that Farmer's Edge does have is a variation map. Uh, and I find it's even more accurate in terms of how it lines up with the yield map. So, uh, you know, I think this is something that's really been helping us out and kind of just, you know, keeping an eye on how the, the crops are progressing through the year. Another one just gets back to topography and it's pretty basic, but, um, you know, topography, every time we uh, overlay a yield map or something, uh, topography has a pretty significant role for us uh, on our farm. Uh, you know, our knolls are usually either gravel or they're uh, eroded clay knolls and, it just shows up in yield. So uh, it really helps kind of help, it helps us create management zones around them, soil sampling techniques. And then topography for me is just helping with uh, tile layouts as well. And sometimes they just provide a lot of explanation. Sometimes when you're going through the field, you might not feel there's that much grade in the combine and, and the, the map you see here on the screen is an accentuated topography but um, even that little bit of accentuation helps kind of show that yeah this those little bumps are actually yielding less and then uh, you know you know have some issues there maybe from an enroll at null, null standpoint or just you know creating a different management technique for those areas 
And, you know, I think I'm giving almost every platform a shout out here, but uh, here's field, uh, here's field view. And what's really cool about it is it's a really intuitive uh, interface. And that's kind of why we use it still. We use it in the sprayer because um, I'm not a super big fan of the Pro 700 we have in our sprayer. I find it kind of clunky. Uh, and it's not a really great user interface. So we uh, basically put the, well, we use FieldView because it's in the planter tractor anyways, because of our, our planter setup with the precision planting tools, but we actually use it in the sprayer as well uh, with the puck to pull that information off and just have a really clean user interface. Uh, but with the app on your, you know, with a, an iPad, you know, you can do hybrid uh, comparisons pretty quick where you just take your finger and you draw a circle around those areas and it, it's going to puke out a, this one yields better than this one. There's a caveat to that. You know, I think uh, Justin maybe mentioned it about yield, yield monitors are, aren't super accurate all the time. And I think you have to take that in consideration, but Sometimes it's also, you know, it's just, just good information to have or it gives you a feel for what things are, are looking like. And what's cool about that is that you can pick a spot where, you know, there's some topography differences or a different soil type and you actually might identify what hybrid might be performing better than another one in those areas. So uh, it's really cool the fact that you can just do that on an iPad with your finger. So uh, that's kind of why we use that and it just... Um, we do a lot of comparisons on our farm, you know, a lot of product testing, a lot of ROI and uh, results and analysis and, and, and treatment uh, comparisons. You know, and so you get into drone and drone imaging and uh, it's hard to see as well on this picture, but uh, on the right hand or sorry, the left hand side is a farm that we had tiled and just using drone deploy uh, the app and connected with our drone, uh, we were able to do an aerial image of, uh, get a tile map out of it uh, for future reference. And I know you get these from your, sometimes you get them from your uh, tile provider. Um, but the cool part about this one actually was when I was doing the flyover with the drone, I could see where there was two bad connections and we had two massive blowouts. So I called them even before getting into the field to say, we got a couple issues with the tile. Uh, I need you to come out and fix them. So uh, it's pretty cool just to look at stuff. And uh, we we kind of use it just to check on things. And, uh, uh, you know, I guess they're fun to, to fly. They're not fun to find if uh, you run into issues. And uh, I've spent 45 minutes looking for one before too. My recommendation is never buy a black one uh, because they hide really well. So when we look at our farm in future direction, uh, my emphasis really are looking for tools that mitigate risk. I think that's the biggest challenge we have in our farm is just trying to figure out, uh, identifying what our risks are and then trying to find tools to mitigate those. Uh, you know, climate is a risk. Uh, you know, anyone who grows crops, uh, we do uh, rely significantly on mother nature to provide the right recipe to give us good results. But I think really uh, we're trying to find those tools that help mitigate that, uh, you know, just talking offline before we started this and, and talking about yields across Ontario, uh, you know, on our own farm, just some of that technology that's gone into hybrid development um, is one of those tools that's helped mitigate the climatic risk that we do have. Uh, and it just, feels like we're fighting uh, mother nature more and more every year. And we're just looking at tools to help mitigate that. I think there's a big space for sensor technology. I'm not sure where or how yet. I know that, uh, you know, that smart firmer uh, that Justin mentions are a really cool sensor technology, but uh, I'm looking more towards even just better weather data. Uh, you know, even within the field, uh, we have one weather station that covers our 1,700 acres. I don't think it probably is reflective of everything that's happening, but I, I would like to see a little bit more that way because I think it might help create some algorithms and better uh, tools in terms of fungicide application or uh, risk of different pests. Uh, you know, even like we could take Western bean cutworm as an example. Uh, we're going to spend a lot more time doing uh, precision financial analysis. I think uh, we get caught up sometimes in the hardware and the cool maps, but uh, it really has to make money at the end of the day. So we're going to spend a fair bit of time of some really hard drill down profitability mapping uh, and really develop some standard operating procedures around ROI against products 
uh, and, and specific to relationships and their field produ productivity zones. So how does this product treatment work in high yielding areas and low yielding areas? And can we use our application technology to really target those better? And sometimes this is a dirty word, but carbon credits. Um, I, you know, if you look at the consumers and uh, society in general, I think this carbon economy is not going away. Uh, you know, even with the, our federal government that uh, I guess, you know, from our standpoint, we'll have to, we're looking at is where's opportunity there. And is it some of our data uh, that we have actually can it actually help us uh, get some dollars out of this uh, area or out of this marketplace uh, yet to be determined, but it's uh, something I don't think we should ignore. And a lot more effort, I think, towards product use efficiency. I think Clinton uh, mentioned the four R's uh, with fertilizer, and that's really a direction we're going to, and, and fungicide applications, looking at some of these bigger ticketed items from an input standpoint and just making uh, better use of them. So I think the greatest challenges that I see uh, in uh, precision agriculture, uh, it was interesting. There was a tweet by a gentleman, Shane Thomas, uh, he does a newsletter that's uh, pretty interesting. It's Upstream Ag Insights, uh, and he sends it out every Sunday. And uh, it's pretty cool because it, it does touch a, a fair bit on the ag tech space. Um, and he posed a question, what are some of the, greater, the greatest inefficiencies in farming? And uh, I answered by saying data conversion and migration across platforms. There, this doesn't seem to be a smooth way to move data around yet that I can find that I'm happy with. Uh, maybe my standards are too high. And I sometimes when you do uh, move data over, they say they can do the migration, but when you look at it, it's not the cleaned up data that you have. Uh, I spend a fair bit of time cleaning up my data in SMS, uh, but when I put it into other platforms, I don't see that cleaned up data and it just, it, it has zero value to me because it's not cleaned. Uh, so that's a big issue that I think It'd be really cool if a third company could come in and provide APIs that would just do this automatically for people. But uh, that's my own gripe. Um, the ag tech investment space, I think it's interesting. I think this this point really hits home to Harvest Profits being bought by John Deere. Not that it's bad. It's just uh, you kind of have this, I don't know, relationship with a company or a startup that you feel you kind of help them get on their feet and get going. Uh, and then you kind of see them move on to someone bigger and better. And you're just worried that uh, it might not get the focus that it, it got from the original founders. So I, I think, you know, that's a communication thing that really needs to be developed a little bit better in the egg tech space as these startups get rolled into uh, other companies. Um, just how you create that comfort from a user level to be okay with, uh, those those uh, those uh, purchases, and sometimes we just get into the issues of not having enough data, which sounds crazy because we have a pile already. But sometimes it's just not the right data, and I think that's a struggle that I find right now is that we have data, we have data at the wazoo, uh, but sometimes it's just not the data I'm looking for. So, uh, and then lastly, time. I've never have enough time. I finally decide that I actually have to start paying someone to do some of this stuff because. I have grand illusions that I can do it, but I never actually get it done. So uh, time. And I think lastly, uh, this is, I think everyone's aware of DOT, uh, you know, DOT that uh, started there in Western Canada and now is owned by Raven Industries. This picture here is a pretty cool farm I visited in Queensland, Australia, and it's called Swarm Farm. And uh, it's a, it was a very large, uh, they would call it uh, arable farmer uh, that was always after the biggest and best and had to have, you know, the biggest air seeder or whatever. And then just realized that was kind of not really the best direction because they're having compaction issues. They were having uh, inaccuracies across uh, planting depth across an 80 foot seeder. So he started creating these 70 horsepower little tractor power units called like he calls it swarm farm, but his vision is to actually have, two, three, five of these working in a field, uh, lightweight, uh, all kind of automated and actually off the shelf parts. Like he wants you to be able to go to a hardware store to buy a pillow block bearing to replace what's gone on this. Uh, his, his desire out of this really is just to own the, the uh, 
I guess, intellectual property behind it and even slap this on something else. Uh, very community kind of based idea, but um, I do think this is the future uh, as labor becomes more difficult to find as uh, some of this other stuff of this becomes, you know, some of this equipment just becomes huge or inaccessible. You know, if you can have something like this among two farmers that runs 24 hours, that actually might get more done than we're getting done a day anyway. So it's the autonomous side of agriculture is fascinating and I, I'm excited to watch that grow. And uh, it was really cool just to see this uh, when I was in Australia. So I think with that, I'm done. So thank you and look forward to any questions. That's great, Mark, really appreciate it. Now we'll get over to, to Bo. If you're ready, Bo Jack uh, Jacobson, we'll uh, get you to do a little bit of, about who you are and what you're doing in, in farming. Sounds good. I appreciate the invite here and I apologize. I don't have much of a slideshow put together or at all. We're still busy down in the States counting votes. So we, we don't have a lot of extra time, <laughs> but uh, no, Bo Jacobson, uh, partner in Jacobson Farms and uh, owner of Free Make Solutions. Uh, we farm about 15, 16,000 acres uh, between my brother and I and a couple of key employees. And, uh, you know, we've kind of split from our family farm back in the early 2000s, uh, you know, as it got handed down from great grandpa to grandpa to uh, dad and the uncle. And uh, we just kind of started doing our own thing and uh, got involved in the crop insurance business 20 years ago. And, uh, and it, it's kind of been part of our uh, part of our operation. Um, got involved in precision planting about a decade ago and uh, into the seed business. Uh, so. Um, we've kind of diversified, which has helped support our farming habit, if you want to call it that. So uh, we've latched on to technology early, um, got involved in the rural power network of the RTK side of things uh, early on and uh, kind of took that and ran, got more and more confident in it and, uh, you know, kind of just built things uh, around technology and uh, continued to use it to grow, learn uh, kind of some, sometimes on the uh, bleeding edge versus the cutting edge, I guess. But uh, it's, it's always fun, it's exciting. Um, you know, we've been involved in multiple different things, uh, different business ventures, uh, you know, fail and succeed. Um, you know, we grow a variety of crops between corn, soybeans as the main ones, uh, dabble with a little bit of wheat, uh, some dry beans and the sugar beets uh, has kind of been, uh, been our, our growth has kind of been focused around that or not so much our growth, but uh, that's our, our high dollar intense crop, I guess, so. Uh, which is also, you know, which has driven us into the technology side of things, uh, variable rates, uh, you know, the, uh, the precision planting, the, the any small investment that we can get back or ROI we can get back is it really shines in that crop. So and carried that over into the corn. And so that's uh, kind of a little bit of a history of where we came from. Um, you know, one thing I would say, uh, it talk, you're listening to the other guys here in farm size and a lot of diversity, um, you know, I don't feel that our, our land size or our acreage size is, uh, is really gaining as, as much value as it is being able to bring in uh, key people to our operation and partner with them. Um, that's allowed uh, you know, one of our guys to focus on the precision world, one of our guys to focus on the seed world, one of our guys to focus on the crop insurance. So um, bringing in key management where, uh, you know, like a lot of us have talked about time, you know, being short of time, uh, You've been able to bring those guys in, focus on their specialties and uh, and be able to implement a lot of this stuff versus uh, hopes and dreams on the shelf. We can actually uh, put somebody in charge of a, of a project and uh, hopefully capitalize on it. And so, um, you know, similar with a couple of you guys, our planters are all set up with precision planting um, Been uh, doing the high speed planting since 2015, uh, running the V applies, uh, doing our, our row by row uh, Fertilizer control in for and a two by two with our nitrogen and uh, and sulfur. That's uh, made big dividends for us and in, uh, in the adverse weather that we have. Uh, we're, I suppose I think uh, you know other than up in Lanigan, we're we're probably north of the other two two of you guys, so we're constantly at risk of frost. Um, again, this year we had uh, you know the top thirty bushels of our corn crop was taken out by uh, early September frost, so a bit disappointing, but. Uh, you know, so we're just trying to, you know, manage risk just like the rest of you guys and uh, like everybody out there between how we set up our crop insurance, between how we, uh, how we pick our seed varieties, how we set up our planters, how we're using the technology. So planters are full blown precision, um, pretty much anything we can have on them is on at least one of them. And 
in the sprayer world, we're running uh, the in command system on the sprayers and uh, same thing, cutting our costs down to a minimal amount. We've been uh, running a uh, surefire quick draw system on our spray trailers, getting our chemistry uh, from, from what our usage is to what our invoices in are there, you know, within a percent or two of what we purchased and what we've used. And having multiple people in the operation is uh, that technology or that precision technology has really helped us uh, on the uh, record keeping side of it and the management side of it. Uh, you know, we, we can break everything down, uh, you know, to the gallon, to the ounce. So very, very little hard feelings between partners of who got this and who got that and uh, who's, who's paying the bill, who's responsible for what. So that's probably the, uh, the number one thing that I've enjoyed about the uh, precision world is, uh, is just the documentation and uh, in detail that we can pull out of it. Uh, you know, we're really colorblind when it comes to equipment. Uh, we're running uh, deer and egg co-planters that are retrofitted with precision. Uh, we're running case sprayers. We've ran uh, case combines, John Deere combines, uh, running vent tractors. Uh, so we're, we're just kind of open to whatever piece of equipment or whatever piece of precision technology can put the, uh, put the best ROI on the farm. And, uh, and, and we've made a lot of mistakes. We've, uh, we've, we've tried things that have failed and, uh, and uh, you know, we hopefully we learn from it, and uh, hopefully we we can pinpoint whether it's weather driven or whether it's a management decision that was that was wrong or just the, the wrong equipment or or not a, not a good fit for what we're doing. So, um, you know, on the on the harvest side of things, we're running the John Deere combines at this point using uh, the John Deere Operations Center to collect data to monitor where fuel levels are at, where equipment is sitting. Uh, um, also collecting yield data there using the line sharing for planting and for harvesting. Um, also using field view. We've worked with them for uh, a number of years now. And uh, um, just like the rest of you had talked, using the, having, being able to digest or diagnose uh, yields by hybrid, yield by soil type, uh, yield by practice that we've used uh, throughout the growing season, uh, whether it's fertility or uh, or using uh, fungicides or whatnot, um, using different attachments on the planter to see what uh, closing system is working, whether or not we're getting the value out of the speed tube on an agronomic side or just on the uh, economic side of it um, with the high speed. So, you know, just, just kind of wrapping everything together. Um, when it comes to the record keeping world, we're still, Going back to the basics, using uh, you know the the way scales on the grain carts. That's our number one fallback documentation that we've used, and uh, it seems pretty primitive in the world we live in, but uh, still hard to argue with a with an actual weight uh, versus the uh, you know using a, a yield monitor or whatnot or a calibration that may change slightly due to test weight or or crop moisture is. Uh, you know, that's probably the frustrating part when you think you got something in there and you got multiple guys and machines and uh, and yield monitors don't always match what grain carts are and it's easy to find a hole if we if we missed one grain cart load uh, that, but if we uh, were just a, a three four or five percent off on a, on a yield monitor it becomes frustrating it ends up being a lot of uh, a lot of dollars that can change hands in an operation if it's not properly documented so that's probably our biggest frustration so far on the on the yield side of it but uh, or on the record keeping side. Uh, but we, we do load all of our information from our input side and our record keeping uh, or the harvest side of it into the conservice program, which is uh, uh, as similar to harvest profit, maybe not as in depth when it comes to uh, tracking uh, grain markets and whatnot. That is a, definitely a plus that they have. So, you know, we, we feel we're getting, getting value from all of, our, all of our equipment, you know, between yield, um, you know, between uh, the efficiencies, between the, the documentation on things, but, uh, you know, and being able to monitor the soil health. Um, you know, we're mostly a conventional till farm. Uh, we do have some ridge ground that we dabble with some strip till and uh, have been having a fair amount of success in the no-till world now that we've been uh, been setting up the planters with the two by two. So we have a, a, a way to get the nitrogen on and the sulfur on, uh, you know, and getting proper placement. Um, that's, that's probably one of the things that is, uh, has really shined in the last five years or so that we've been able to, to work with. Uh, you know, a lot of you guys mentioned tile. We're probably one third of our farm is tiled and uh, probably 20% ridge ground where we really don't fight excess moisture, but uh, 
in the Red River Valley here in the fringe areas, we, we lose more money to excess moisture than we ever do drought. So uh, uh, using the variable rate, uh, trying to put zones together, trying to decide what part of the field gets the high population, the low populations, um, same thing on the fertility side, you know, where we, where we kind of try to bomb on the fertilizer, hoping to get the best return. Well, it's, uh, we really don't have that answer until the combine gets there, because if we are, uh, if we're excessively wet, uh, the high ground is, uh, is, is where we should have been uh, trying to get our maximum yield. And if we have a, a dry or, or closer to normal, which I'm not sure what normal is anymore, but then, uh, then it's the lower ground that we really should have put, uh, put more investment in. So, um, we try and use some weather models to forecast what what the upcoming year may be like, and then we try to use previous yield data to see, uh, uh, you know, on those years that were similar to say a 2006 dry year, or a 2012 uh, drought, or the 2016 year that we can we can overlay that if we froze up relatively dry or forecasted to go in dry, maybe we'll weigh heavily heavily on on those years yield maps to figure out how we should be preparing for the uh, the 2021 season I guess you know as an example of where we're sitting right now so but like I said this year we end up with a with an or a September frost and that uh, throws everything out the window again so um, it uh, uh, you know we, we are overwhelmed with data and uh, knowing when to use it how to use it and and where to go pull it from and, and how to get it into a usable format quickly um, is probably the biggest challenge. Um, and then like we've talked, there, there is no one company that has, that has really uh, been the leader on that. Uh, they all have a, a lot of value, but uh, all have some weak points too. So, um, you know, I guess it, it really depends on what, what crop we're dealing with on how in depth we are. We try and use a, a KISS theory on, on every crop on a high level of, uh, you know, we're using defensive varieties uh, that we can plant over a large number of acres and then use land that's been in the operation for a number of years to dive in a little deeper in zone maps or in grid maps uh, and uh, that we have a fair amount of history from and, and try and use a little higher level of management on that and, and uh, learn as we go um, using our yield maps and technology to, to uh, prioritize where we need to increase tile, um, where we need to start on tile, um, and being involved in government programs that may, may assist us or cost share with us on, on tiling uh, highly erodible land and uh, buffer strips and whatnot. Um, you know, just uh, kind of taking it a, one step at a time and, and what we can do and, and where we should be putting our investments you know, moving forward, uh, you know, I don't see us uh, going away from anything we've done. We've probably slowed our rate of adoption on newer technologies, um, you know, with companies that are coming than we have in the past. Um, seems like with uh, the economy strong, you know, through uh, 2006 to 2013, uh, everybody had uh, a lot of technology come to the market in a few years after that had quick ROIs, had game changers like the high speed planting or the nozzle by nozzle shutoffs on the sprayers or, uh, you know, but that seems to have somewhat slowed as the egg economy has, uh, has tightened up a bit. So, you know, we're kind of waiting for that next big uh, breakthrough on, uh, on a, a real good ROI or real good value added product. Um, and I'm not sure what that's going to be. Um, we're just kind of sitting back making sure we can uh, digest what we're doing and perfect what we're doing. But uh, one of the companies that has caught my eye recently is Pattern Egg. Um, they've been doing soil tests and uh, looking through uh, different soil diseases or, or crop diseases that are out there, being able to pinpoint different zones in your field that, uh, that may have uh, a higher risk of white mold or may have uh, Oh, may have a higher risk of cercospora or something in a sugar beet or, or different corn diseases. So uh, we've, we've tested a few of our fields or five to 10% of our farm this year that we're working closely with those guys to see, uh, see if we can track that uh, using proper variety selection and, uh, and uh, walking the field throughout the growing season to see what, how, how close some of those things are, how much we can predictably um, make adjustments versus reactively go out and, uh, and put a, something to control or something to save a crop. Um, so that, that's probably our biggest uh, excitement going into the 21 season uh, as far as technology.
is, is trying to understand more predictively what we're up to. Um, you know, in the egg world, we always seem to be very good at reacting, but uh, predicting is, uh, you know, it's kind of where things are, are, are I, I see things headed, you know, and I know, uh, you know, one of you guys touched on, uh, uh, you know, the uh, autonomous tractors and, and that that is really exciting and doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, labor is a major concern. Um, and uh, the knowledge of the labor force that we have, uh, you know, it's not steering wheel holders anymore. You can't go find the, go find the guy at the local pub and throw him in a tractor for a couple of weeks and, uh, you know, get tillage done or get planting in. It's, uh, you know, you need uh, college educated or real world ed educated individuals that can understand the technology and know when to make changes. And, uh, you know, so I'm, you know, with the, the autonomous world, if we, if you're in a drier climate, uh, it, it could be quite exciting, but, uh, yeah, I, I see it as a major challenge in the, in the heavier soils, the wetter areas that aren't tiled, you know, how you can make those decisions on soil moisture, on dillage plugging, on planters plugging, and, uh, you know, how, how that's actually going to work, you know, um, you know, how we get around potholes that are, that we may not be able to seed through, but can spray through or vice versa. You, uh, you, you plant through them and they're drowned out by the time the sprayer gets there or the combine gets there. So the interior borders of fields change drastically on a year-to-year -year, uh, basis. So, you know, it's uh, it's exciting times that we were in, but uh, um, I really don't know what uh, where the world is going. Or, uh, but it's it's been a fun ride. That's great, Bo. Really appreciate that. Um, so we got a bunch of questions that we're going to get to, um, but I guess the first question for for the growers that are just getting into precision ag um, or, you know, getting more involved for, for you guys that have been involved in a long, for a long time, um, what mistakes have you made that uh, they can learn from that they won't do uh, as they, they get uh, involved in it? And uh, we'll go with just in order. I guess we can start with Justin at first, if that's okay. figure out how to unmute myself. Um, mistakes for new guys. Um, I mentioned if you're not updating stuff to the cloud, depending on what platform it is, you got to back it up. We've lost a lot of data from monitor failures and that kind of stuff. Um, and then just know what you're doing before you get to the field. Um, my uncle, guy that runs the combine most of the time, has said to me numerous times every year, he's like, if we added up the amount of hours we sat at the entrance to a field trying to figure out how to get whatever the RTK won't click on, or we can't find the field, or the field view isn't syncing with the iPad, or you gotta you gotta know what you're doing ahead and you gotta you gotta have a plan. You gotta have support too. Okay. How about you, Clinton? Uh any, any, uh... yeah, I think, I think my, my comment would do it right the first time. Uh, I, I know we're all farmers. We we're looking sometimes to cut corners and get some things a little cheaper. And I know in the past when we've bought cheaper technology, it's been cheaper technology and, and you end up paying for it later on and you have to rewire stuff or, or buy something that's better off the just buy something better off the bat you use there's enough guys on these chat lines you know what's good and what's crap and and um let's listen to some of the other farmers who have used this stuff because i know i've we've used enough crap in the past that i will not support it going forward so okay mark i think just to pick up on clinton's point uh you know i think as farmers uh as, as competitive as we are, we, we need to work a little bit better together. So if I was someone new and younger, I'd really look towards another farmer that's experienced and, and mentor, be mentored by them a little bit um, and, and work with their experiences and how they do things. You know, I, I think uh, that's probably the best way to do it. I kind of have, you know, I wouldn't say taken it on myself that way, but I, I've learned a lot of mistakes the hard way i have a shelf of misfit toys i call it because we don't use them anymore but uh you know i guess i i'm pretty open and transparent with other producers that 
And if they want an hour of my time to sit down and, and talk about what might work and not work, I am completely open to that. So I guess my, my point would be if you're new and getting into this, try to find someone that's willing to take you under their wing a little bit and, and help you out. All right. How about you, Bo? Yeah, I would agree. You know, having that mentor or a uh, trusted advisor uh, and, uh, and documentation backing it up, you know, multiple forms of records, you know, don't just rely uh, on what your yield monitor is telling you, make sure you're doing the old fashioned way wagons, you know, um, and uh, yeah, and don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to, you know, losing money is, uh, you know, um, the cheapest uh, education I ever had was my college education. Uh, you know, we lose more money every year doing it wrong than I ever paid for a year of tuition at university. <laughs> Oh, well, well, thanks for that. Um, so we, 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 we talked a lot about the, the hardware side of things um, and a little bit on the software, but what's been in the last three, four, five years been the number one uh, addition to your farming operations that have improved either profitability, um, time, um, or sustainability? You can take it uh, just... Oh, open up, anyone can answer at any time. I guess if, if you want from my perspective, it, it, it's a no brainer to have sectional control on your equipment. Um, just failure to put that extra seed or that fertilizer in those rows, um, it, it pays huge dividends. And when you, when you work out the numbers, it might not sound lots. I, I gave the example of 9.5%. Um, but that adds up pretty quick and, and 9.5% allows us to, you know, upgrade equipment or buy new technology every year. And, and it's, it's definitely worth it. That in the last five years is definitely our biggest improvement. I would say beyond just, you know, section control, cause I would agree hundred percent, it's the easiest payback, but in the last probably a couple of years for us, really it's taking more accurate weather data, uh, uh, growing degree day accumulations and satellite imaging and putting them together to really watch how that crop is reacting to current weather conditions uh, and trying to make management decisions to mitigate further risk. Uh, and we're seeing some pretty good return on investments by taking that data and using it to just uh, help the crop uh, through some of those stressful periods, whether it's heat stress or, or drought stress or whatever. Um, but that, that tool of satellite imaging, uh, good quality imaging and kind of that weather data are kind of working hand in hand. And I just, I would like to see a little bit more in the future with those two tied together. Anything for you, Bo? You know, I would uh, agree wholeheartedly with those guys. Um, you know, section control, uh, whether it's on your planter or on your uh, sprayer is a must. I mean, that's that, that's fairly entry level. I mean, if you're going to do anything, that's where you start. Um, you know, and educating yourself. And if you're in a position of, uh, of hired help, making sure your help is educated and taking part in trainings and conferences and understanding what you're doing and they're, they're they have a vested interest in, in what your operation is doing. You know, uh, quality people is, is priceless. Perfect. Yeah, for us, I think uh, the biggest ROI has been, we've run section control on our planner for a while and, and definitely that's huge. And for it, we ran a stock case meters before. And this year with the precision planning system, you know, dad, we we're out scouting the field and he's like, you know what? I used to be able to just kind of like, you just weave your way through the rows and you find some skips and you get across, but it's, it's literally a picket fence. Like there's no skips and it may not seem like much, but those, you know, a couple extra cobs every 17 and a half feet that adds up. And then the same as our, like Bo said, he's running B applies to like our our nitrogen is section controlled, our infro fertilizer section controlled, like we're not wasting and we're not overflying and, uh, and we're not burning. We had issues on some of our sand ground where if we put the nitrogen overlapped from the headland into the, uh, into the rows and uh, we would smoke some corn in there too. So 
you can take that section control as far as you want. And, and I think that's going to continue to pay. Right. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay. So we're going to go do some, some direct questions here. So I think uh, the first one is for Clinton because this one came up really early. Is it, uh, do you feel that uh, using anhydrous ammonia is sustainable for the long term? You know what? And at the beginning, I said I'm an economist. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an agrologist or agronomist. Um, uh, I, I know there's been some discussion around using NH3 versus the other forms of fertilizer. Um, NH3 is unbelievably cheaper than any other form here, uh, at least in Lanigan, Saskatchewan. Um, I, I can't speak to the, the long-term viability. I take my, my uh, recommendations from uh, Western Ag and, and that's what we input into our system. So I, I would say though, that one of the issues and, and we're talking about uh, uh, technology and, and uh, if we want to change, for example, to go to liquid fertilizer, um, then all of a sudden we have to pay for that extra um, storage capacity, the uh, different um, uh, fertilizer application system on our drill. Um, so it just, it becomes an extra cost. So I guess from where we were at and where we started, that made the most sense. Um, whether or not it makes the most sense in the long run, uh, economically, I, I actually don't, I don't know. Anyone else want to kick in on that or no? Okay. Well, oh, don't, Justin, go ahead. Well, I don't know if I should say it, but... <laughs> The uh, I would keep watching some of these like regen egg videos. And there's a, a story one guy said when he was uh, over in Europe in World War II, they would use anhydrous to make runway strips because it made the, the ground compact so hard. And they would just blast it with uh, NH3 and pack it down and blast it some more. And, and those runways are still there. Like that's a huge uh, compaction cause. And I have no clue as to the truth of that story. But, uh, oh, I oh we, we land we land fighter jets on our land though too so <laughs> <laughs> you know we we've never had any issue with soil compaction on our land um but again um we may have in the future so all right justin this is a question for you so, um did you find variable rate corn planting profitable and i guess bo you're probably doing the same i mean doing the same thing I think that largely depends on your ground. Um, if you're in the Midwest and you just have like beautiful dirt from end to end of your field, it probably doesn't like just plant 36,000 seeds an acre and you make a million dollars. But for us, um, we're in tobacco country here and there's a lot of sand and we have a lot of clay too. We, the, the field that the guys are combining right now has everything from a marsh to like literal blow sand, you would go to the beach there. So for sure, variable rate corn pays on that kind of ground. So Bo, you have some uh, different land, uh, different uh, topographies there. Are you using variable rate? We are, you know, we're variable rating probably 80% of our farm. And one thing I can say is it doesn't cost you money. You know, with today's hybrids, uh, you know, they'll flex enough. If you're 5,000 off or 2,000 off, um, I don't see a significant yield impact. But, uh, you know, we're running anywhere from 15,000 up to 38,000. And uh, it, it, when you've, you've got varying soils, um, what you're saving in seed, uh, you know, in, in those marginal areas uh, is a huge payback. And uh, if you try and hit the average for that, I do believe you're giving up yield through, uh, through your high productive areas. So, um, it's a minimal investment, especially if you're going to a row by row shutoff system, which that alone will will justify the uh, the cost of the electric drives or the or the shutoff. So you'd have the technology to do it. So from that point on, it's uh, it's a no brainer to at least be putting in jet strips and uh, trying to educate yourself on what your soils can handle. Okay, that's great. Um, so Clinton, um, question for you. How many soil samples do you take per field and at what resolution? Uh, and what are the decisions for making the, doing that? I, I apologize. I actually saw that question. I was hoping you'd skip it because I actually don't <laughs> know. <laughs> I okay. have no idea. 
Um, again, um, not my forte. Um, the recommendations come from Western Ag in terms of, of each piece of land and, and the optimal um, kind of base uh, uh, fertility. And then from there, we vary it within the field. So I, I don't know what they actually use in terms of the amount of sampling and the, the data, uh, the satellite data. Okay. Well, thanks for, for answering that. Um, next one's for Mark. And Mark, you were talking about all the various uh, platforms you're using uh, with some um, issues with uh, connectivity and not doing the right thing. What does the ideal uh, platform look like for you? Or for any of you, I guess. I'm not sure if it's actually specific to a platform. I want to be able to just like drag and drop files over and have the same data go across basically that's clean. So if I were, to, for example, if I'm using my SMS software uh, and have a yield map uh, all cleaned up, I would love just to have that in a file, drag it over and drop it into um, say field view. Uh, and I know they say they can do that, but you got to upload it as a zip file. Uh, sometimes the shape file doesn't get converted right to the way I want to see it. And it just doesn't go over right. You know, I, there's a guy in Australia that I had a, a, a few beers with uh, and talked a lot about data. And uh, he's kind of of the same mindset that I, I did or I am. And he did his whole Nuffield project on data. And it would be just awesome if there was some third party company that had all the APIs that could just through, through their service, you just drag it through their service and it goes into another uh, program clean, whether it's a display or whatever, just like guidance lines, like guidance lines from egg leader to a pro 700. I just like, it drives me to drink. Um <laughs> And it's inefficient and yeah, I can spend time in the winter to do that. But if all of a sudden we got a new farm that spring last minute, then you're trying to do boundaries. You're trying to move boundary files. It's just, we need to do a better job and realize that farmers are going to use multiple platforms. I think that's just the nature of it. Uh, we're not going to ever use one platform that I'm aware of. At least that's my opinion. So we have to do this better um, as an industry because uh, I think it will let us use data better and be better at it. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think that's the uh, kind of the, the battle that you guys have because uh, the platforms want you to use one and one only and uh, nothing works perfectly, so. Yeah, and that's, I, I apologize. It's a bit of a soapbox speech, but uh, you know, I think <laughs> it's just. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, so question for you guys, um, it's about, um, well, how do you feel about sharing your data um, when it's being uploaded to a, a, like an open platform? Is that something that you're concerned about? What is, what is that with you guys? Do you share in a large, or do you keep it very uh, kind of only to certain people? You know, I guess I, I can answer that. Uh, personally, um, sharing my data does not bother me. I think, uh, you know, if we're worried about some company, somebody using it against us, I think in, in the satellite technology, you can get close enough, you know, within a 10% yield variation possibly that, uh, you know, uh, there's technology out there or coming shortly that they're, they're so far ahead of that of using regional data or or information, uh, you know, that they can make their decisions with. Um, and if it comes down to your own farm and, and data sharing, uh, as we operate our own, our, our own operations or, or work on our own operations, we, there's enough other things that we can do right or wrong to, to generate revenue or lose money. Um, you know, I, I'm open to sharing data with anybody that can bring an ROI to the information I give them. Um, and uh, we share our data with our customers on the business side of it, um, and they share their data with us. So, uh, you know, I think somebody's talked about that in their presentation. It's, uh, you know, our, our neighbors aren't our enemies. Uh, you know, we're, we're one to 2% of the global population here. Uh, we, we need to unify and work together to, to get better at what we do. Okay, that's great. Um, 
I have to say that's well said because I agree a hundred percent with you. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I have no issues sharing my data and I, I, I do think that we can do this better together. Something that I kind of get fired up about and I know they're changing uh, moving into 21, but field you charging you to use their system and you know they're making money on all of your data that you're uploading. So I think they're stepping in the right direction. But at the same point, like if you're on the internet in the year 2020, you got to know that everyone is watching what you're doing and taking what you're doing and monetizing it. So if you, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Facebook, you know, everybody's selling your data and that's unfortunately, whichever way you feel about it, that's a fact of life. That is true. Um, so we got uh, a question from one of our, our students at Olds College. What advice would you give to help young adults in the family farm uh, operations talk to uh, their parents about the benefits of adopting technology? Uh, sorry, I, it almost makes me laugh sometimes when people say that because that, my brother and I struggle with this. Um, we have pretty much everything is GPS controlled on our farm, yet my 70 some year old dad refuses just out of principle to use certain things, not because he doesn't wanna learn, just by principle that if he's gonna be in that tractor, he's gonna damn well touch that steering wheel and use it. So our swath or wind rower, for those that don't use them, um, he always, loves the fact that his lines are not perfect because that means he was steering that. And I, I can, as much as I want to change his mind, I can never convince him. I, I will never. And as a result of that, he doesn't run our sprayer. He doesn't run our planter. He doesn't run our combine because they're all GPS. And, and that's fine because if, if he's still a hired hand that or somebody that can still do other things on our farm, we're fine with that. It is a difficult process. I, I, I deal with some of these individuals um, with farm and food care that just do not like technology, don't want to use it. Um, once you get behind that eight ball and like if you still have a flip phone today and you don't have a smartphone, it's a big technological jump to get into a, a auto steer machine, right? So mm -hmm. um, I, I, my only suggestion to the student would be to just have some patience with that individual because um, they've done their life of, of doing farming the way they are. And if they're not willing to change, I think sometimes we need to just respect that, you know, keep it up in that you still want to have that Thanksgiving meal with them when you physically can have it um, and, and avoid some of that confrontation. At least that's my view. Well, and then Justin, I guess with, with your family, um, you're, you're the, uh, the, the tech guy um, met uh, met your family last year. Have they adopted it, or do, or do they see the value now? Uh, yeah, my advice would be to start slow. Don't don't jump. Don't do a cannonball and and buy every single thing that you can put onto it. You know, start with um, probably GPS in the planter and GPS in the combine, and. Uh, and just be able to track your varieties and make some yield maps and then just slowly ease yourself in. That's the, the best way to learn. And uh, if you can, if you're the one who's going to be the IT guy, um, no, pick a company that has good support um, and be ready to support the person that's frustrated because they can't plant or combine because those are, you know, time sensitive things and, uh, if you're pushing for it, you got to back it up, as I have found. <laughs> and and you have been successful doing so. So the the one thing I I would add, and it maybe gets back to my point before about talking or finding a mentor. You know, if sometimes when I have those conversations back when I was first coming home with my dad, um, I would always kind of reach out to someone my dad always respected. Uh, and, and, you know, look to as a, as you know, I don't I hate to say it, but as a good farmer that I would sometimes uh, have them talk to each other. I wouldn't be the person trying to convince my dad. I would let my dad talk to someone that uh, was using that technology and kind of spoke to the value of it and someone that my dad would trust and, and, you know, respect it. So, 
uh, you know, sometimes those are opportunities too to find someone in the neighborhood or it doesn't even have to be a neighborhood, just someone that, you know, that parent or whoever respects that might be able to have that conversation on your behalf. That's great. Um, so Bo, you talked a little bit about this um, in your presentation, but uh, what do you guys see um, down the road? What uh, technology or hardware or equipment, machinery coming down the road that, that will help change what you're doing in, in farming? You know, uh, I, I think it's, it's getting more into the predictive egg. Um, trying, trying to forecast what the, what the season is going to give you, um, you know, and if we can harness that, which that's, uh, you know, it's like betting on the stock market or the grains of where things are going to go. But, uh, you know, if, if there's a way we can predict weather a little bit better, you know, we can, we can, uh, increase fertility, decrease fertility, increase seeding rate, decrease seeding rate. Um, you know, when it comes to the fungicides, uh, if, if we could understand the, the climate better, we, there's years we get no ROI on a fungicide and there's years we get a 10 to one on it. So um, the predictive egg is probably what I see being the next big change, whether or not that happens um, or how long it takes or if we'll even see it in our generation. I don't know, you know, uh, the future is the only thing nobody's ever been able to harness. <laughs> That's true. Uh, anything for anyone else on that one? Uh, any other uh, technology or, uh, I mean, uh, Bo did say, uh, talk about uh, autonomous uh, vehicles. Is that something that you see could change things? I think that, but I, I just think sensor technology, I think as you know, the, the fact that you can get uh, processing power in such a small little bit of, I guess, with circuitry, uh, amazes me. And I just think that sensor technology, you look at new combines and how they automate, uh, automate that whole, that whole process and with sensors and cameras and everything. I just think that this stuff is going to become so, so I wouldn't say cheap, cost effective, um, that we're just going to, we're going to be inundated as producers, I think of opportunities to use this. And it's just going to be a, a really big learning curve because i think that's the next big to be honest the next big thing like i you know i envision that we'll be planting sensors with the seed and it will be sending us information about soil characteristics as the plant's growing and we can you know be proactive versus reactive and it'll be biodegradable like i just think that's i believe i'll see that in my lifetime and that we're going to have to figure out ways to integrate that into our management so you know, to an earlier question, the sooner we can get people to adapt to technology, uh, they'll be able to grow with this and we need to grow with this. And as an industry, uh, both in the tech space and in agriculture, we need to do a better job of communicating it so that um, it, we're not pulling people with us. We're, we're going together in unison. I was going to say one of the things, and and we were talking, we've been talking about some of the progression of technology, and and you know I, I do a lot of talking with consumers about this of how you know what we did 20 years ago that was the best we knew at that time, and what we're doing right now this is the best we know at this time, but in the future there's going to be new things that we're going to look back at the process or the things we're doing now and say, well you know that seems prehistoric. Um, one of the new technologies um, that I heard about just uh, here in, in Saskatoon is, is the technology to actually pinpoint, um, and I'm not too sure what, if it's sensor or infrared, the technology on sprayers to cut spray application down 90 to 95%. Um, holy crow, like in terms of a good news story to consumers that we can cut our um, herbicide, fungicide, whatever, and pinpoint whatever we're trying to, to kill for that pest down to that just pest, um, that's phenomenal. And, and I think for, for me, when I look out and when I talk to consumers, I use that as an example of, you know, that's where we're striving to be. And once we get there, again, it's gonna th make things more efficient, more effective, um, better for the environment and, and uh, just better through the, the sustainability. So I, I see that as a, something that I'm, I'm looking forward to, at least in, in my lifetime as a farmer. 
Perfect. All right. So we're uh, we're probably gone a little bit long. So we're going to go to one last question, and it's from our presenter this morning, Barney, from Microsoft. And he says, do you have any advice for foundational technology providers such as Microsoft? And I didn't, uh, I was unable to catch the presentation, so my apologies. But you know, I think um, what I really would like to see is uh, more engagement uh, with these um these companies with farmers directly. Um, and, and really, uh, you know, cause I think working together, uh, we can come up with solutions a lot quicker that are more adaptable for us on the farm, uh, and applicable, uh, cause they have a phenomenal resource behind them and some powerful, powerful tools. Um, it's just trying to get that dialogue between the farmer and them. Perfect. Well, um, gentlemen, um, um, on behalf of farms.com, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I think uh, we've already gotten some great feedback about a great presentation you've all done. I think you've created great value for them. So I want to thank you very much. Uh, a virtual clap here. Um, <laughs> And so uh, I'd like to thank everyone else who was able to, to join us over the last three days, as well as our Ag 101 and 201 um, sessions that we had earlier. Um, as I said, um, I think I posted earlier that uh, all these sessions will be available for the next 10 days. So if you missed anything, weren't able to come, you can catch them over the next 10 days. So you can catch all, this, all the presenters. It should be a great great value for you to, uh, to see those. Um, just a reminder that next year, our, fingers crossed, our, uh, our conference will be in um, Red Deer, Alberta, and that will be November 16th and 17th in 2021. So mark your, mark your calendars now, and uh, let's hope that this, uh, this virus is not uh, sticking around much longer. Again, thank you very much. Thanks everyone that joined us. We hope that we gave you great value uh, and you got uh, really enjoyed this conference and we'll see you sometime really soon. Goodbye.